Do all season tires grip wet roads better than summer tires? Are winter tires more expensive? If you have a four wheel drive, do you need winter tires? Today we're looking at tires and some common myths. Tires help your car to move, stop, and steer, but many drivers take them for granted because they don't understand the engineering and science behind them. Car tires can be classified into two categories based on tire construction and features. To understand this, let's talk about plies. Plies are the layers of different fabric that make up a tire. The most common ply fabric is polyester cord. A tire strength is often described by the number of plies it has. Most cars have two plies. Compare that to a large commercial jet tire, which have 30 or more plies. A bias ply tire is made with the plies laid out diagonally. Its layout causes the tire walls to be a bit more rigid and therefore less flexible. Bias ply tires generally has the advantage when it comes to load carrying capacity. In other words, they're generally better at hauling heavy loads. That's why you can see this type of tires on loaders, excavators, and mining trucks. They really don't care how they ride. On the other hand, a radial tire is the standard when it comes to the average passenger car and truck. Radial tires feature radial plies that run perpendicular to the direction of travel. The advantage of this layout is that the sidewalls are more flexible than bias ply tires, so you get more stable grip and contact with the road, less vibration, and most importantly, a softer ride. There's also less heat buildup with the radial tires, so it has a longer tire life. Radial tires usually have steel cords or a blend of polyester steel and fabric, which are coated with rubber. The downside to radial tires includes handling because the low lateral stiffness causes tire sway to increase as the car's speed increases. Also, since the sidewalls are more flexible, they can bulge if your tire is overloaded or underinflated. This can lead to damage and puncture of the tires. The radial tire is also more expensive to make than a bias ply tire. But remember, it does last longer and this can result in cost savings in the long run. Ever notice the code on the sidewall of your tires? It's a bunch of letters and numbers. What do they all mean? The code indicates the size, type, and performance ratings of the tires. Let's break it down. Usually the code starts with a letter. If that's the case, the first letter tells you what class of tire it is. If it's letter P, it means it's a passenger car tire and is suitable for cars, SUVs, crossovers, minivans, and small pickup trucks. The letter LT indicates it's a light truck tire and designed for vehicles that are towing trailers or have three, four, or one ton load capacity. ST is for special trailers like boat trailers, utility trailers, or trailers with fifth wheels. But if there's no letter at the beginning of the code, this means you have a metric tire. In other words, it's European metrics and it might have different load capacity. After the first letter, you'll see a set of three digits. That's the tire width from side to side when you look at the tire head on. It's usually the measurement taken from the outer side wall to the inner side wall in millimeters. Next, you'll see a forward slash number. Following that is a set of two digits. This indicates the aspect ratio. The bigger the aspect ratio, the higher or taller the tire sidewall or profile. The ratio is a percentage. Basically, it's the sidewall height divided by the tire width. For example, if the aspect ratio is 65, it means the sidewall is 65% as high as it is wide. Next is a letter which refers to the internal construction of the tire. Normally, you'll see either the letter R or D here. The letter R means the tire is a radial tire, which is the industry standard for most passenger cars. The letter D means it's bias constructed or diagonal. Plot. The next set of digits is the wheel diameter in inches. In other words, it's how wide the wheel is across the center. The next set is the tire load index. Basically, it's how much weight the tire can support. And last set is the speed rating. Usually, it's a singular letter. The code represents the top speed it's safe to drive for a sustained amount of time. A higher speed rating means the tire can handle heat and also provide more control at faster speed. So which came first, the tire or the wheel? Well, it's not the chicken or egg question, it's much clearer than that. Of course, the wheel came first and the tire second. The story of the first tire starts with Charles Goodyear. In the late 1830s, a self-taught American chemist, Charles Goodyear, was engaged in the production of rubberized footwear and fabric. At his enterprise, he produced rubber toys, clothes, shoes, and umbrellas. However, the properties of this material didn't allow the products to be of high quality. The rubber melted from high temperatures, was quite fragile, and had other disadvantages.
challenges. Goodyear took this problem seriously and started experimenting. The story goes that he accidentally heated a mixture of rubber and sulfur in a kitchen stove and thereby created a recipe for rubber that didn't soften in heat and didn't become brittle in the cold. At that time, he didn't even suspect that vulcanized rubber he just developed would become an integral part of the automotive industry. He fine-tuned the chemical process to create and manufacture pliable, waterproof, moldable rubber and patented his technology in 1844. The Goodyear Tire and Rubber Company was incorporated in the U.S. in 1898, but it wasn't by the inventor Charles Goodyear. Actually, it was founded by Frank Sieberling, who named the company after the inventor. The first Goodyear tires became popular because they were easily detachable and required little maintenance. Even the Ford Model T came equipped with Goodyear tires. In 1846, just a few years after Goodyear's experiments, Robert William Thompson, a Scottish engineer, patented the air-filled tire. He didn't succeed commercially because the idea was too early for its time. Then in 1888, John Boyd Dunlap, a Scottish veterinary surgeon and inventor, reinvented the pneumatic tire for his child's tricycle. He made wide hoops made of water hose, put them on the wheels, and inflated them with air. A little later, he attached a rubber tube to the metal rim of a spoked wheel with rubberized canvas to form the tire frame. Dunlop's invention caught public attention. The timing worked in his favor since bicycles were becoming very popular, and the lighter tire provided a much better ride experience. Dunlap claimed not to know about Thompson's earlier invention, and he sold his rights to his pneumatic tire to a company for a small cash sum and a small share in the business. Later, this business endeavor came to bear his name. Dunlop Pneumatic Tire Company, and today Dunlop, is currently one of the largest tire manufacturers in the world. In 1890, the Englishman Bartlett and Frenchman Didier invented methods of mounting and dismounting tires. All this made the use of pneumatic tires for cars more viable. Around that time, two brothers, Edouard and André Michelin, who ran a rubber factory in France, became enthusiastic about the pneumatic tire, and they worked to develop and patent the removable pneumatic tire. They would go on to further develop key innovations in the tire market, eventually designing and commercializing the radial tire in 1946. So what's the difference between summer, winter, and all-season tires? Summer tires have a specific rubber compound for excellent grip and handling on dry and wet road in warm conditions. Summer tires have reduced rolling resistance, provide more fuel efficiency, and produce less road noise. The tread pattern on a summer tire is simpler with less grooves, but when the temperature drops to below 45 degrees Fahrenheit, the compound becomes hard and brittle and the tread cannot properly handle snow or ice. That's why if you live in an area with extreme winters, it's prudent to get winter tires. Winter tires provide better grip for roads covered with snow and ice, as well as wet roads in cold conditions. The tread on winter tires contains more natural rubber. This means it doesn't harden when the temperature drops below 45 degrees, but it will stay flexible in cold weather, which helps reduce the stopping distance when you're braking. The tread also has deep grooves to dig into snow and ice. It also has a lot of sipes to clear water and slush and reduce the risk of hydroplaning. You shouldn't use winter tires in the summer because the rubber compound is too soft for dry asphalt, so it'll wear out much faster. Also, it requires higher fuel consumption and makes the tire noise louder because of the higher rolling resistance. Many new cars come equipped with all-season tires, which are general tires that have some of the characteristics of both summer and winter tires. It's like a hybrid solution, but more jack-of-all-trades, but master of none. Here's why. They're adequate for dry and wet roads or roads with white snow. It's good for cars in mild winter conditions where temperatures rarely fall below freezing, but I wouldn't recommend it if you live in an area with extreme temperatures. In the winter, four-wheel drive cars can help get a car going, but it won't do much good when you're trying to brake. The four-wheel drive helps control the tires, but if your tires aren't flexible enough or have a tread designed to push snow and ice out of the way. So it's inaccurate to think you don't need winter tires if you have four-wheel drive. Maintaining proper tire inflation is simple, and it's important for the overall tire performance of your car. If your tire is properly inflated, you'll get longer life, quicker steering response, better fuel efficiency, and a smoother ride. Underinflation and overinflation can cause premature tread wear and possible tire failure. So, remember to check your tire pressure once a month. A good rule of thumb is that your tires lose one PSI every month after you fill them. That's why once a month is a good guideline. You can use the digital or standard tire pressure gauge or an air compressor found at many gas stations, though many of those don't work at all or have bad gauges, so it's a good idea to have your own gauge and glove box. Car makers specify the recommended PSI for when the car is cold. 
Tires are considered cold, not based on temperature, but it's just a term for when the car's been parked for three hours or more, or if the car's been driven less than one mile at moderate speed. That's the ideal time to check the pressure. If you're measuring your tires when they're hot, again, not the temperature outside, set their pressure to four PSI above the recommended cold inflation pressure as a general rule of thumb. You can usually find the recommended cold tire PSI in a driver's side door jam or owner's manual. Remove the valve cap from the first tire. Place the pressure gauge on the valve stem. Press down hard so that the hissing sound disappears and the gauge provides a reading. Refill any tires with low pressure. If you're using air compressors, be sure to read the directions because many air compressors operate differently. It's good to check the pressure again after you fill your tire. So, safe driving, check your tire pressure once a month. And if you like this episode, please share this video. Thanks for your support.